Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. I'm using an old text. <laughs> I'm Elizabeth Donahue. I'm the Associate Dean here for Public and External Affairs, and um, I'd like to welcome you to our conference, Civil Liberties in Times of War. Um, we're thrilled to host this event in partnership with the, one of the school centers, the Law and Public Affairs Program, um, LAPA. Um, also with Mud Library, which is the home of the, uh, all of Princeton's archives, and of course the ACLU itself. Um, we did start yesterday, but not all of you were here yesterday, so I'll give you a little recap on how this event came to be. Um, Dan Link, who's right there, uh, from Mud Library, who's our archivist, um, wanted to um, do something to publicize the fact that Princeton has the entire ACLU archive, is that right? Which is pretty impressive given that we don't have a law school. Um, but I, I'll attribute that to uh, good relations between the ACLU and Princeton and Dan's hard work. Um, so uh, we were trying to brainstorm about ways that we could really highlight the fact that we had an archive. Um, and then to do so in a way that fit with a policy school. Um, and so really what we're going to do today is look at both the historical and the legal record um, of all these amazing ACLU cases um, and then try to glean some policy implications out of those that might inform how we look at issues of civil liberties and um, in times of conflict today. So I think it's going to be a really interesting day. I'm thrilled with the, the panelists who have agreed to come and do this. It's really, um, they really are the top um, legal minds of the country who are thinking about these things on a daily basis. So um, I can't quite believe the good luck we've had in, in um, having everybody come. So to start off the day, I'm going to introduce Anthony Romero, who's part of the great class of 1987. Um, he's been executive director of the ACLU for the past 13 years. Uh, where he took the helm of the organization just seven days before the 9-11 attack. So as you can imagine, he has overseen the organization through some very interesting times. And he is then going to introduce Susan Herman, and the day is going to start. So thank you. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. I'm delighted to be here this morning and delighted to be back on campus. It's really quite remarkable to be walking around the campus. and. I see that the students have, have gotten younger since I was here, so. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that we are able to talk a bit about the history of the ACLU at the university where our archives reside. We are thrilled to have the partnership with Princeton. Princeton has done a remarkable job over the last 60 years housing our archives. And we'll hear more from Dan this morning about the extensiveness of those archives and what is contained in them. I, I like to think that what's contained in them is an important part of American history. And when I go back and look at some of the early documents that talked about the founding of the ACLU, it gives me enormous uh, pride and, and enormous gratitude to know that this organization has grown on, with the help of many individuals in this room. Uh, I was struck when I was looking at some of the earliest documents just how far we've come. In the first year of our establishment, there is a paper at the Princeton Archives that talks about our, in 1921, the ACLU already having 800 cooperating attorneys in 47 states. They talked about having 1,000 correspondents and investigators across the country, uh, individuals who received questionnaires to track trends and demographics that they saw in their country, in their, in their counties and states. We had cooperating committees of attorneys in 17 cities within the first year. And this was a time of enormous unrest with the great coal and steel strikes. There were lynchings across the country. Even in the first document in 1921, there was the very first infographic that showed the level of reported lynchings across the country. It was really quite ahead of its time, the early ACLU. They talked about their top 10 priorities, which seemed very resonant with the priorities we have today. They talked about racial equality. They talked about stopping the deportation of immigrants, of the need to reform immigration law, for dismantling this FBI spy network, the need to protect freedom of speech and freedom of expression, and the right to a fair trial. One of their top priorities was the execution of uh, propaganda, as they called it, getting the facts out on our point of view. Um, they earmarked $4,000 of their $24,000 annual budget just for this purpose, understanding that the 
importance of civil liberties would be in changing hearts and minds and not just changing laws and the minds of judges. Uh, it was a remarkable beginning that only went from strength to strength because of the good work of individuals like Ari e. Dyer and Nadine Strawson and others in this room. When I look at what has made this organization truly remarkable has been the commitment of many lay leaders who have played exemplary roles uh, on our board and also as cooperating counsel in our cases. From the very beginning, we enlisted the help of some of the nation's leading jurists. Felix Frankfurter was one of our founders, as well with working with Roger Baldwin and Jane Addams, Helen Keller, uh, Margaret Sanger, and others. Uh, today, we are 1,000 staff nationwide. We have 380 people in the New York and Washington offices, and then the bulk of the 600 staff in the state offices throughout the country. It still reflects the vision that in order to be effective on civil liberties, you have to deliver the response where you're closest to the problem. This is not a problem that you can address flying in and out of Washington or New York. You have to live in the communities to be able to address the injustices that they confront. And the way we do that work is with the assistance of many talented, committed uh, individuals who serve on our national board and serve on our local boards. The, the national board plays a very vigorous role in helping set the priorities and the policies for the organization that now the staff carry out. I'm fortunate that I have uh, the greatest boss in the world. Uh, I have Susan Herman, who is the president of the ACLU. She chairs our 83-person national board uh, takes a very unruly group of individuals and brings consensus out of what seems uh, an impossibility. Uh, her skills as both a civil liberties leader and as a law professor and as someone who has dedicated her life to civil liberties has helped make this organization all the stronger. Um, she was elected president of the ACLU in October of 2008 following the illustrious leadership of Nadine Strawson. She served as a member of the ACLU Board of Directors and the Executive Committee and then the General Counsel. She was also on the search committee that hired me for the job 13 years ago, and so I thank her for that. She is, in, in her uh, few waking moments, she is also the Centennial Professor of Law at Brooklyn Law School, where she teaches criminal procedure and constitutional law and seminars on literature, terrorism, and civil liberties. She wrote a remarkable book in record time that has really chronicled the impact of civil liberties in the post 9-11 context. It's called uh, Taking Liberties, The War on Terror and Erosion of American Democracy, published by Oxford University Press in 2011. It was the winner of the 2012 IIT Chicago Kent, Kent College of Law uh, Palmer Civil Liberties Prize. Um, she is a, a, a well-versed in all the matters confronting the ACLU, and especially on issues regarding criminal law and due process and constitutional rights. Uh, she graduated from uh, Barnard, uh, then a small college associated with Columbia, uh, lamentably not Princeton, and, and a JD from New York University Law School. So I'm delighted to introduce my dear friend, my leader, and my boss, uh, Susan Herman. One nice thing about having hired Anthony is that I now feel it's perfectly fair to take credit for everything he ever does. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about Anthony a little later on, but I think one thing I want to say now is in addition to Anthony's many wonderful attributes, one thing that I always like is he always gets the tone just right. So when he calls me his boss, I think he gets exactly the right balance between actual respect and a bit of irony. <laughs> Try telling Anthony what to do, right? <laughs> yeah, he's a he's model employee. So before I get to the Anthony Romero Civil Liberties Union and that era, I want to start with our founding era, which as you know, the ACLU was founded in January of 1920. And as I usually tell the story of our origin, and as we all do, it's our website and our rousing speech version, the ACLU was uh, founded in response to several kinds of threats to civil liberties that our founders perceived happening during World War I and immediately following World War I. Um, there is the current, to your right, is the current logo of the ACLU, 
To the left is the oldest one that we could find. This is not, in fact, from the 1920s. I understand it's from the 1930s. So you'll note the Thomas Jefferson quote, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, or as our development department likes to say, eternal fundraising is the price of vigilance. <laughs> so some things never change. But by 1920, it would not have been news that war is dangerous to civil liberties. I'm sure you all know the old Latin maxim uh, attributed to Cicero, inter arma silent legis. In times of war, the laws are silent. Now, during World War I and right after World War I, the laws, of course, were not altogether silent. But as I tell the story, there were two principal areas where our founders were quite concerned that our usual constitutional principles, our fundamental values, were in fact being not altogether silenced, but muzzled or muted. Uh, number one, the First Amendment. Free expression was being muzzled during World War I. People who expressed dissenting points of view about the war, about the draft, or about the American form of government found themselves shouted down, dragged off the stage, and actually criminally prosecuted for their unpopular speech. I think as a general matter, in time of war, national unity tends to be valued more and individual expressions of conscious, conscience less. So the First Amendment was the first big area in which the, framers of, of the, the founders of the ACLU were very concerned about what had been going on and continued to happen. Uh, second, xenophobia is another typical byproduct of war. And as you all know, that festered even after the war had ended in the Red Scare. And the founding of AC, the ACLU in January of 1920 came on the very heels of the Palmer Raids, pictured here. The Department of Justice dragnets rounding up thousands of non-citizens for detention, harsh treatment, abusive interrogation, and deportation. So I'm going to talk about both of those issues, the First Amendment and the Palmer Raid, Palmer Raids. And my plan for today is first to discuss how the ACLU's founders addressed these violations. Because even though it was not news that civil liberties suffer in time of war, the ACLU founders were trying to find new ways to address that phenomenon. Then after talking about the founding era, World War I, I'm going to basically skip to the um, 21st century metaphorical war, the, the war on terror, to contrast the sort of then and now, how the ACLU founders set a template for what the ACLU has done ever since, both in times of peace and certainly in times of actual or metaphorical wars. Um, in visualizing this room full of eminent historians, I decided that I did want to go a little uh, further beyond our usual website or rousing speech version. So with the help of our wonderful internal ACLU archivist, Snow Zhu, and her staff, I started looking at original documents. And when I started digging deeper, I came up across three you know, complicating factors to my usual story of origin. Uh, number one, I realized I'm not a historian. I was trained as a lawyer. So in telling you some of this history, I am hoping that at least Sam Walker and Jeff Stone will find some parts of it familiar, because they are my chief go-to sources. Um, this is my disclaimer in case I get anything wrong. And will everybody please not give Arya Nair any rotten tomatoes, because Arya will know if I say anything that's inaccurate at all. So that was problem number one. Problem number two is that when you start looking at the original documents, the archivists and I were having actually a very complicated time, because it is often difficult to tell what it's fair to attribute to the ACLU. In those days, the ACLU, Sam is nodding, good, thank you, Sam. Uh, the ACLU was working with a lot of collaborators, and there were a lot of individual people who worked with overlapping organizations or sometimes on their own behalf. Now, the, um, the staff at the time was very small, so we were mostly working through all those cooperating attorneys and correspondents, et cetera. This um, fight for free speech, this is a 1921 report it's the first major statement of the ACLU about the work that the ACLU was doing. You see at the top there, can I get that? Against the forces of suppression. And in this report, it describes all the kinds of things the ACLU was working on. But I think it foreshadows much of the problem that I was having in trying to emulate good historians. Because one uh, quote from this document inside, it says, much of the work we do does not appear under our name. And I found that to be true. There are things that the ACLU seemed to be doing under somebody else's name. And sometimes it was hard to tell whether something that was being done under somebody else's name, in fact, was fairly attributable to the ACLU. So I'll give you some examples of these attribution issues as we go along. The third complicating factor that I ran across is that right now, I don't know how many of you know this, but there's not one but two major revisionist law review articles by young legal historians challenging our story of origin. 
you know, trying to explode our myth. It is not true that you know, the ACLU and civil liberties grew and started challenging the executive branch and national security and fight. So one of those is by Jeremy Kessler from Columbia, and the other is by Aziz Rana at Cornell. So I'm also going to try to incorporate a little bit of these revisionist stories and where they're sort of challenging our story of origin as I go along. So in starting, I think that it is fair to begin the story during World War I because in many respects, the ACLU is a child of war. Although the ACLU was not around during World War I, our co-founder, principal founder, Roger Baldwin, certainly was. And he was, in many ways, laying a lot of kinds of groundwork for what was to become the ACLU's vision of the First Amendment and for our future work. Now, throughout his life, I'm sure many of you know, Baldwin was a prodigious consumer of the First Amendment. He liked to brave arrest by going out to places where he was not supposed to be speaking and reading the First Amendment. Uh, he also very much shared the dissenting views of a lot of the people who were being controversial during World War I. Uh, the views about communism, about labor. He opposed the war. He opposed the draft. So the whole idea of protecting dissenting viewpoints was not to Roger Baldwin an abstract principle. He was very much talking about things that he wanted to say. And some of you may know that he was so vigorously opposed to the war that he ended up refusing any form of service or alternative service and ended up in 1918 and 1919 spending a year in prison, uh, actually it was 10 months out of a year's sentence, rather than submit to even any form of alternate service. Now, in addition to very much believing in the power of uh, individuals, the power of individual expression and individual conscience, Baldwin was also very much a believer in civic organizations. Baldwin and Crystal Eastman, who you see there on the other side of this, not many people know that the ACLU has founding mothers as well as founding fathers. We had a little dinner last night where the tables were marked Roger Baldwin, Crystal Eastman, and Helen Keller. How about that? So, you know, founders of the ACLU. But even before the ACLU, Baldwin and Eastman were both leaders of the American Union Against Militarism. Now, this was, you know, just opposing the war. So Eastman and Baldwin then began within the American Union Against Militarism. They began a civil liberties bureau in order to defend conscientious objectors. From there, they then spun off the National Civil Liberties Bureau. This was a national independent organization. And the purpose, in the words of Crystal Eastman, was to maintain something over here that will be worth coming back to when the weary war is over. So it was the National Civil Liberties Bureau that then begat the ACLU. So what options did Roger Baldwin's ACLU in 1920 have for fighting the forces of suppression? Well, Congress would not have seemed like a very good bet at the time. Congress during World War I, I think it is fair to say, was hard on the First Amendment. Congress had passed an Espionage Act, a Sedition Act. Uh, they had censored speech. They had criminalized disloyal speech. And in addition to those you know, sort of obvious attacks on the First Amendment, the Selective Service Act of, of 1917 limited the channels of dissent by only recognizing conscientious objectors if they were actually affiliated with a religious organization. You know, not our concept today, but it was a very narrowed concept at the time. So after the war ended, the ACLU was still playing vigorous defense in Congress, fighting the first peacetime sedition act, and in the state legislatures, fighting for repeal of state syndicalism laws. So you know, Congress certainly would not have seemed like a place where you could go and expect to restore civil liberties or get better First Amendment protection. Uh, now, the Woodrow Wilson administration, I hope I'm not being a bad guest to say, did not always enjoy a good reputation for its support of civil liberties. Um, nevertheless, I think the Wilson administration would have seemed like a better bet than Congress to Roger Baldwin and, and his colleagues. And here's why I want to mention uh, Jeremy Kessler's account, his sort of revisionist account of the origins of civil liberties. Because what he says, he traces the origins of civil liberties not to the ACLU after the war, but what was going, to what was going on inside the Wilson administration during World War I. And the star of his show is Felix Frankfurter. What Kessler talks about is progressive lawyers within the War Department, particularly Frankfurter, who were finding ways to push back against Congress's First Amendment limiting statute. So there's the Jeremy Kessler article for you, if you want to check that out in the Columbia Law Review. It's called The Administrative Origins of Modern Civil Liberties Law, and there's Felix Frankfurter. <laughs> 
So in Jeremy Kessler's account, Congress has passed a statute in which they have very deliberately refused to acknowledge as conscientious objectors people who are not affiliated with the religion, and they're afraid that they're going to sweep in, if they go broader, they're going to sweep in all the anarchists and the people who they don't think should be permitted to uh, not fight in the war. What Frankfurter did in Kessler's account, and he says this is largely forgotten, certainly it's not a chapter I had known, was Frankfurter managed to craft a policy that allowed administratively, that allowed the, uh, a board uh, established by the administration to grant conscientious objector status to people who were not affiliated with religions. His justification for that was that the president was commander in chief and that the president got to decide how to deploy people in the war, regardless of what Congress had said. Now, naturally, there was a lot of controversy about this at the time, whether or not the um, administration was defying what Congress had wanted them to do. But Frankfurter's approach that, in fact, the executive branch had a lot of discretion to apply CO status more broadly than Congress certainly had intended was something that did carry the day and that President Wilson did support. So I'm happy to be able to say that in the Woodrow Wilson uh, Pro Civil Liberties Act. Now, um, Kessler makes much of this because he says that these administrative origins of constitutional law and civil liberties are not adequately appreciated, and that instead of our usual account where we regard protection of the First Amendment as something that's coming from outside government, Frankfurter and the other progressives very much saw civil liberties protection as something that was the job of government, and they saw the protection of individual expressions of conscience as feeding democracy as something that should be incorporated within democracy and within the executive branch. So I think it's a very interesting article, and I think one thing that it highlights is that under our very large civil liberties tent, the ACLU has always had people of many different ideologies, progressives, liberals, libertarians, and among us, we have always had people that even though we agree on some of the same issues of our day, the civil liberties that should be protected, we have different accounts of why that should be. Sometimes it's the more libertarian view that's much more skeptical of government, and sometimes it's uh, a view, a more progressive or lib liberal view, that's much more optimistic about the government's role, especially the executive branch's role, in actually being, maybe, maybe being a better protector of civil liberties. Uh, now, of course, one of the corollaries of the view, if you're going to be an advocate of this administrative constitutionalism, and if you think the ultimate goal is to have democratic decision making that is going to incorporate and be pluralistic and incorporate more individualistic viewpoints, the corollary to this would seem to be deference to administ administrative decision making. And that, in fact, is where Felix Frankfurter ended up going. When he became a Supreme Court Justice, there were a number of cases in which he wanted to defer to democratically made decisions, much to the dismay of his former ACLU uh, colleagues. So I think Kessler's uh, article is very interesting. It's kind of giving us a richer account of the many points of view, but I don't think that anything that he says is really that inconsistent with our story of origin, because in fact, Roger Baldwin, what he was trying to some extent to work from the inside, but he was also very much trying also way, new ways to work from the outside, and there were all those people of different points of view. So uh, what Roger Baldwin's uh, ACLU did in its campaign to restore First Amendment freedoms was they did try to find the places with, within the administrations, the Wilson and then the Harding administrations, where they might be able to make some progress from the inside. So um, there's President Wilson. You all know what he looks like. This is Postmaster General Will Hayes. Uh, according to the accounts that I read, thank you, Sam, uh, 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 Postmaster General Hayes frequently consulted with the ACLU about what would be an appropriate censorship policy. And with some assistance of the ACLU, in 1921, he decided to end the wartime censorship of mail. Okay, so there's one internal victory. You're not quite Woodrow Wilson, but, uh, but definitely an administrative official at you know, lower than the top level. During the same year, 1921, ACLU leaders met with President Harding to argue amnesty for political prisoners with some limited success. Here's Eugene Debs leaving the White House after he's just met with Warren Harding, who commuted his Espionage Act sentence to time served in December of 1921. Uh, President Harding did not commute that many sentences. There were some, but you know, not nearly as much work as he might have done. Now, we can only wonder whether that success would have been greater if Ro Roger Baldwin had persuaded his colleagues to adopt his strategy 
of 24-hour-a-day picketing of uh, President Harding, both in the White House and even on the golf course. I don't know if that would have helped, but you know, th there, there was one idea that the ACLU did not implement. Uh, what may seem surprising today, when the ACLU is mostly known as a litigation organization, is that the idea that you could litigate civil liberties, that you could go to the courts and challenge what was happening either during World War I or after World War I and expect any kind of success, that it wasn't plausible at the time. So although Roger Baldwin, as Anthony was just saying, was perfectly happy to enlist a whole lot of lawyers for his own purposes and to use them, the ACLU originally was not really dominated by lawyers. Lawyers were not central to who the ACLU leaders were. The original executive committee, uh, only three out of 20 of the members were lawyers. Uh, today, I think, if my count is right, I think we only have one out of 12 who are not lawyers. <laughs> you know, so th that uh, has really shifted. The ACLU leaders, as you've heard, included a lot of people who weren't lawyers, the people like Crystal Leesman, who I don't think was a lawyer, um, Helen Keller, Jane Adams. Uh, the first two presidents of the ACLU were ministers. The last three have been constitutional law professors. Okay, you can see the shift, you know, much more toward law. So what Baldwin did believe in, as what Anthony was saying, is public education, what he called propaganda. And so the ACLU sent out pamphlets they sent out dozens of pamphlets on all different topics in their first few years. And the basic idea was to just let everybody know what was going on and then move on from there. Now, in the decades that followed, of course, the ACLU was involved in litigation efforts that led to what we today regard as First Amendment gospel, that the courts will protect freedom of dissent, even during times of war or crisis, except under extraordinary circumstances. Well, that took a long time to develop. You know, there um, were prosecutions uh, where the Supreme Court had, you know, uh, to date, to uh, 1920, the Supreme Court had never actually upheld a First Amendment challenge. There's Schenck, there's Debs, people who were convicted for speaking, and the Supreme Court did not uh, reverse their convictions. So it wasn't until the Gitlow case, where Benjamin Gitlow had been prosecuted for criminal anarchy for publishing a left-wing pamphlet that the Supreme Court, I think, took a step forward. Gitlow was the, Supreme, uh, the ACLU's first case in the Supreme Court. And in the opinion, the uh, majority of the Supreme Court has some dicta where the court says for the first time that freedom of speech and press are fundamental rights and liberties that are protected by the due process clause. Now this dicta augured a more active counter-majoritarian role for the courts in the future. And this expanded idea of judicial role, that you could go to the courts to challenge and claim, you know, wave your First Amendment bow banner and get the court to undo what the democratically you know, elected Congress and president had decided to do, really became the linchpin of a lot of the ACLU's work on behalf of liberty going forward. So uh, before I turn to the Palmer Raids and talk about that second area of the ACLU's work, I want to time travel a little bit and just jump forward to what I consider to be the high water mark of judicial protection of unpopular speech during time of war, and that is the great case of West Virginia versus Barnett. Um, during World War II, as during World War I, there were calls for national unity and increasing impatience with any sort of expression of conscience or dissident view. The Jehovah's Witnesses, as I'm sure you know, believed that they could not pledge to a flag, they could only pledge to God, and that it was violative of their religious beliefs to have to pledge to allegiance to the flag. A 1942 uh, West Virginia statute had declared it to be an act of insubordination to refuse to pledge to the flag, and therefore, Children who refused to pledge to the flag, who are the Barnett girls, were expelled from school, and their parents were dragged through the streets, yelled at, beaten up. It was really tremendously unpopular to not be willing to pledge allegiance to the flag. Now, Barnett was not an ACLU case, but the ACLU did write what I think was an important amicus brief in the case, uh, under the ACLU's name, so we have no attribution problem here. You can see it says, Brief for American Civil Liberties Union Amicus Curiae. And this looks a lot like our amicus, amicus briefs today. Um, in addition to uh, filing the amicus brief in the Barnett case, the other thing that the ACLU did was to, to continue Roger Baldwin's program of propaganda. So this is the cover of a pamphlet that the ACLU was distributing at the time. Again, you clearly see the ACLU name uh, right at the bottom there. <laughs> 
a pamphlet about Jehovah's Witnesses and the war. And what this pamphlet does is a lot of public education. It explains the religious principles involved. And it also, I think it's really very interesting, an interesting comparison to our work today. It, at the end, it has a whole section about what you can do if you see a Jehovah's Witness being harassed, you know, who you can go to, what remedies there are, who might listen. So uh, Barnett, I think, is one of the most quotable cases about our First Amendment principles. And uh, of course, uh, Felix Frankfurter dissented. Uh, Felix Frankfurter said that it was not the role of the court to judge the West Virginia statute. There was a point heading in the ACLU amicus brief, which disagreed. The point heading says, the courts and not the state legislative authorities must decide when religious liberty must yield to the exercise of a state's police power. Okay, so there's Felix Frankfurter. So that's about what I want to say about the First Amendment for now in terms of that original story. Suppression of dissent has not been one of our principal issues in the post 9-11 era where we've been worrying about civil liberties that have been um, limited by our changes of law. We have had some First Amendment problems, but it's not been you know, the front and center. So when I these days introduce a, a then and now speech, what I really want to talk about is the Palmer Raids because the comparisons between the Palmer Raids and our present situation for the past 13 years is in some ways it's evocative and sometimes feels uncanny. So here are a couple of Palmer Raids headlines and pictures. So um, I'm sure you all know that the Palmer Raids involved uh, raids in eight cities. 7,000 people were arrested, often without warrants, often under recently passed laws, including the Sedition Act. People were subjected to what we have since called harsh interrogation techniques, and very many were deported. Now, the Palmer Raids included you know, all the usual problems of war, the xenophobia. Anarchists were the terrorists of their day. Foreigners were suspect. Attorney General Palmer said at one point that you could tell exactly who was an anarchist and who was a problem because they looked sly and crafty. So easy enough to tell. You didn't have to you know, fill out warrants or anything like that. So um, at first, the American people looked at this and they were told that we have to give up some liberty in order to be safe. And at first, this was a very popular idea. The Washington Post, where's Adam? The Washington Post at the time editorialized there is no time to waste in hair splitting over infringement of liberty. So the Palmer raids and Attorney General Palmer. So the ACLU's first response to the Palmer raids was to mobilize itself. In January 12, 1920, this is the minutes of the first executive committee meeting of the ACLU. And you'll notice at the top, there's the date. And there is the, we are going to be known as the American Civil Liberties Union. And one of the main things they discussed was they worried about the recent sh Chicago raids. So this is a very strong connection between the origin of the ACLU and the Palmer raids. So what then did the ACLU, now that it was the ACLU, do in response to the Palmer raids? Well, this is a very famous report. I'm sure some of you have seen it before. It's a uh, May 1920 report called Report Upon the Illegal Practices of the United States Department of Justice, and it's signed by, whoop, didn't mean to get to him. Uh, it's signed by 12 different people, all lawyers, including Felix Frankfurter, Zechariah Chafee, a uh, number of other, you know, uh, of those initial cooperating attorneys. Now, I'm telling you that this was an ACLU report because all the historians tell us that it was co-published by the ACLU and the National Popular Government League. I've seen some footnotes where some people refer to this as the report of the National Popular Government League, which is also accurate, but that leaves out the ACLU participation. Now, you may notice that if you look at the bottom here, this says reprinted for Workers' Defense Union. Okay, that was one of the official, officially affiliated organizations of the ACLU. We had a list of affiliated organizations. So what happened was that these pamphlets were being distributed by the ACLU, by the National Popular Government League, by the Workers' Defense Unit, Union. Uh, people were charging, this is 25 cents. I've seen other pamphlets that sold for 30 cents. Who was keeping those profits? And so it's a little hard to tell, because if you find these pamphlets, it's very hard to tell if you know the range of all the people who are publishing these. So here, you know, we have seen ones here. Uh, it is reliable to say that the ACLU was disseminating this. It's fair to say it's an ACLU publication. Uh, in this publication, there are 50 pages of exhibits laying out what happened, listing all the constitutional violations involved, 
excoriating the Department of Justice for its unconstitutional activities. And there is a hero here, an executive branch hero, who I'm gonna to get to now, Assistant United States Secretary of Labor, Louis Post. And in his, with his administrative discretion, uh, Secretary Post canceled 1,547 deportation orders. Okay, so there's another example of you know, the kind of insider power in, uh, for the good of civil liberties. There is no mention in this report of any litigation strategy. Nobody's talking about litigation. They're just, it's just lawyers explaining to people what was illegal and unconstitutional about the Palmer raids. And another thing that I think was very interesting, and yet this may have happened before, but as compared with Roger Baldwin, who was always saying what he believed and just defending people who believed things he agreed with, the authors of this report were very careful to disavow any affiliation or any agreement with the anarchists. We're just defending their right to say it. We're not saying we agree. Okay, also a very important strain of the ACLU's work. We don't want to be identified. You know, people still try to say we're a communist organization because Roger Baldwin at one point believed in communism. But since then, and this report may or may not be the beginning of that, but the ACLU has been try very clear to try to disassociate the championship of expression of beliefs with whether or not we agree with them. Okay, so that import, report was tremendously important. It was a very influential, um, informative uh, report. Also on the public education front, Swinburne Hale, who had been one of the 12 lawyers signing that report, published an article in The Nation, also sound familiar, in June of 1920, telling the stories of some of the individuals who had been swept up by the Palmer raids, and also calling for the impeachment of Attorney General Palmer and for congressional hearings. Now, this article by The Nation, I have seen references to this. It's listed by some sources as having been published by the ACLU, now presumably in reprints. So there again, you know, reasonably fair to attribute this to the ACLU, but it's really an article in The Nation by Swinburne Hale, who is associating himself with the ACLU, but is not directly an ACLU staff. Uh, next, federal judge George Anderson of Boston, who is a friend of Louis Brandeis, uh, invited Felix Frankfurter and Zechariah Chafee to file an amicus brief in connection with the habeas corpus case before him, challenging some deportation orders. He had three different cases that he consolidated, and this brief was never explicitly listed as an ACLU product, but because Frankfurter and Chafee were affiliated with the ACLU, again, a lot of people attribute this, which, you know, is reasonably fair, but if I were a historian, I think I would have a hard time deciding, you know, what would be exactly correct to say. Uh, the report did provide Judge Anderson with enough legal grist for an, his opinion in Collier versus Skeffington, which canceled the deportation orders before him, condemned the actions of the Justice Department, and I think helped to fuel a shift in public opinion. So in February of 1921, the Senate was holding hearings. Public opinion had shifted to the point that the Senate was interested in finding out what was going on. So this, this is a little bit hard to read, but it's called a digest of references to evidence of illegal practices of the United States Department of Justice. And it was submitted to the Judiciary Committee, signed by the 12 lawyers in the 12 lawyer group, and singling out, noted by Professor Z. Chafee, so he's sort of the principal author, author of this version. Uh, the only version that I've seen is this one, which was published by the National Popular Government League. There may be other versions out there published by the ACLU, I don't know, which is why I think it must be hard to be a historian. How do you folks do that? Do you search every library and attic in the country to see if there are any pamphlets? Or, you know, our archivists you know, found this. So again, it's part of the general campaign. Um, one more chapter of the, actually I'll tell you this one first. In longer term actions in 1933, ACLU leaders, perhaps in coalition, successfully petitioned the White House to restore citizenship to 1,500 former prisoners who had been convicted under the Espionage Act, which had been used in justification for the Palmer raids. So even though it's not always altogether clear exactly which issues are ACLU issues, as uh, ACLU products, as opposed to our allies' products, the campaign against the Palmer raids did succeed in writing history. Historians today, I think, agree with the verdict of Sam Walker, who calls the raids one of the worst violations of civil liberties in American history. And one nice piece of evidence for the thesis that, as a society, we may learn from our past mistakes is this description of the Palmer raids on the current FBI website, which is really quite critical and a little embarrassed. 
So I can read it at the bottom. It says here, whoops, I didn't mean to do that yet. I meant to do that. Um, at this point, however, they say after describing the events, politics, inexperience, and overreaction got the better of Attorney General Palmer and his department. And later on in this description, this was posted in 2007 on the current FBI website, which I think is really interesting. Uh, later on, the uh, description says quite laconically, this was not a bright spot for the Young Bureau. <laughs> so I think we could agree with that. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna say about the Palmer raids right now, the origins, the ACLU origins, what we were trying to confront and how the original ACLU went about trying to confront it, their different tools and strategies. Now, given our time constraints, I'm going to skip over the rest of the 20th century, even though, of course, it's tempting to, yeah, because I just want to do the one then and now. It just would be too much to cover otherwise. And of course, one of the, some of the highest spots are being covered in the panels later today. It is, of course, difficult to skip over the internments of World War II, the evacuation and internment policies. Uh, but there again, I find it's a little complicated, as you know if you've looked into this, to tell an accurate story about what, quote, the ACLU did during that time. Part of the reason for that is, as Anthony was saying, the ACLU is a complicated organization, and we have affiliates in what's a kind of federalist structure. It's like the state and federal governments. So our California affiliates are very fond of reminding us that they saved the soul of the organization by being insubordinate during World War II and by attacking the evacuation and internment program, period, just as just can't be. The national ACLU had taken a more limited position after a lot of very spirited debate and um, dissension, and the national ACLU decided to challenge a lot of aspects of the internments and evacuations, due process questions, factual questions, but without straight on challenging the permissibility of the program altogether. Um, I understand that, that if you look at the, even the limited national position, that still put the ACLU ahead of any other national legal group at the time in standing up to what was happening in the government. But there are a lot of explanations for why the California affiliates were willing to go further. And one thing that I wonder, that I think maybe Jeremy Kessler has made me wonder about more, is whether the connections within the Roosevelt administration were part of the reasons why the national ACLU was more reluctant to just say to the government, just you're wrong. Now, first of all, we know now that not all the correct information was available to everybody. And there were civil liberties friendly people within the uh, uh, FDR administration. Attorney General Biddle opposed the internments, Ed Ennis, who later became an ACLU leader, was on the inside, I, as I understand it, trying to coach the ACLU lawyers about what they should say and how they should challenge what was going on. So that's a really very interesting example of the ACLU's work, and that's all I'm going to say about that, except, of course, that the Supreme Court decision in Korematsu was a deep disappointment to those who wanted to put their faith in the courts. Um, in skipping over the 20th century, I also do not mean to whitewash the fact that there have been several occasions where the ACLU itself has been uh, considered to have been swayed by the passions of various eras. There is, of course, the expulsion of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn from the ACLU board because she was a communist. And you'll hear things about how the ACLU was roiled by the anti-communist scare. Uh, there's an article in 2006 by former legal director, ACLU legal director, Bert Newborn, which is called Of Pragmatism and Principle, a second look at the expulsion of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. And what Bert says is that perhaps this was an unprincipled act, but it actually was necessary to the survival of the organization. So that's one point where there's been a lot of talk about whether the ACLU itself was roiled by the passions of a kind of war. And in the 21st century, Patriot Act fever caused heated internal debate and dissension until the ACLU decided to refuse grants from foundations that vaguely insisted that we sign agreements not to, quote, support terrorism. So that brings me now to the 21st century. There's the 21st century. Remember those days, Anthony? <laughs> we'll click. I think it's great. And, you know, this is where Anthony started from. So as you've heard, Anthony, start, Anthony Romero started work as the executive director of the ACLU one week before 9-11. Now, while it is, I'm sure, still painful to all of us to recall the upheaval of those days, I can tell you some of the things that were happening. The ACLU office, which is on, OK, we'll click on Broad Street, that's the office where Anthony works. You can see his, he overlooks the Statue of Liberty, appropriately. Uh, several blocks from, from ground zero, 
So the office was forcibly closed and inaccessible. So our new executive director on the job one week had to deal with how do you pay your staff when the payroll is locked in the building? How do you respond to all the eight million press calls about what, what does all this mean about our civil liberties when you don't have your telephones or your computers? And people were not yet, you may remember this about 13 years ago, people did not yet have portable devices enabling them to work remotely at all times. Uh, plus, in addition to everything else, a lot of the people on the staff were traumatized, and Anthony just had to deal with that on a very human and personal level. So I think that Roger Baldwin would have been very proud of Anthony and his staff, because despite the proximity to Ground Zero, and despite all of the terrible disruptions, the ACLU was a loud, prompt, and consistent critic of overreactions to 9-11. Uh, there's my 9-11 memorial shot. So Attorney General Ashcroft certainly had the ACLU in mind when he complained, do you remember this quote? To those who scare peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liber liberty, my message is this, your tactics only aid terrorists for they erode our national unity, you note the phrase, there's national unity back again, and diminish our resolve. They give ammunition to America's enemies and pause to America's friends. Well, Anthony had responses to that, and I'm gonna show you one. This is at the beginning of a Village Voice article written by Matt Hentoff, an ex-ACLU board member who did not always have kind things to say about the ACLU. But in January 2002, he wrote this article called The ACLU on the Ramparts, Who's Afraid of John Ashcroft? And his opening quote from Anthony says, we have begun to tamper with some of the basic laws, laws that strike at the heart of what this democracy is all about. Hentoff's article went on to say of Anthony, you will be hearing a lot from him as the battle goes on to regain our rights. True. So, how did Anthony Romero's ACLU go about fighting the 21st century threats to the forces of suppression during the war on terror? Well, look at the options. With the American people feeling panicky, the Congress in the early 2000s was no better a bet for protecting civil liberties than the World War I Congress. This was the Congress that passed the Patriot Act six and a half weeks after 9-11. And the ACLU couldn't even really play defense in Congress because Congress didn't, decided not to hold hearings at all about the Patriot Act. So although we are, these days, we've been trying to lobby in Congress over the time, Congress has just not been our best bet for how to get protection of civil liberties. Trying to find, there's the USA Patriot Act, Trying to find civil liberties friendly allies within the executive branch headed by George W. Bush did not really seem any less futile. Um, when Barack Obama took over as president, there were a lot of civil liberty and libertarians who rejoiced because they believed that at this point it wouldn't even be necessary to lobby the executive branch to restore our civil liberties. Um, what I heard from a lot of people is, oh, you must be so relieved, now you're done. Yeah, it was as if the ACLU could just kind of shut our office doors and perhaps hang a nice banner outside the doors saying, mission accomplished. <laughs> as we all know, that's kind of turned out not to be the case. And Barack Obama was in fact better with respect to some of the issues we were concerned about. In his first day executive orders, he did express the intention, not that it worked out so well, but he expressed the intention to close Guantanamo and to change our torture policies. But as you know, the surveillance policies are really no different. Now, when I think about how did we do within the Obama administration, you know, Anthony may have some ideas, but you know, I can't think of a whole lot of examples of anybody who rose to the level of Louis Post, you know, just canceling those 1,500 deportation orders, or Felix Frankfurter coming up with a policy, really getting around Congress's restrictions of the ability to become a CO, you know, little bits here and there. But for the most part, it has been extremely difficult to make any progress within the administration. Again, under the Obama administration, I think we could come up with one or two modest examples. But I think what is really quite striking to me, and I think interesting, Grit, since I'm setting the stage, I'm sort of throwing out some ideas that people may want to follow up during the day. But one thing that I think is really quite remarkable is that the civil liberties friendly insiders who we know about from the Bush and Obama administrations became our whistleblowers. There were not people who were able to effect change from the inside. There were people who had to expose things that the government preferred to keep secret by taking them public, by going to the press. So there's Thomas Tam of the Justice Department who first exposed what the NSA was up to, Thomas Drake of the CIA, 
I'm, I'm sorry, of the NSA, John Kiriakou of the CIA, who was the first to talk about waterboarding and what the CIA was doing. And I don't need to tell you about that last guy, Edward Snowden. Okay, so I just think that's extremely interesting in terms of the whole administrative constitutionalism idea of whether things have changed, to what extent we're really dependent on what a particular administration is. And if we were tempted to say, well, uh, the Roosevelt administration, the Wilson administration, different from the Bush administration, we then have the Obama administration to contend with, where we do have a civil liberties friendly president in many respects, but working inside the executive branch has really remained extremely difficult and not that productive. So without having Congress as an opportunity, without really having many opportunities in the executive branch, of course, the ACLU took to the courts, took the road that we had helped to construct. Now, one of the big obstacles to litigation, of course, in the fall of 2001, was the secrecy surrounding so many of the government's actions. In the fall of 2001, we simply did not know how many people had been rounded up, who was being detained, where they were, how they were being treated, whether they were being interrogated. So that became one of our top priorities, and our staff learned to love the Freedom of Information Act. Here are two of our most photogenic staff members, um, Amrit Singh and Jamil Jaffer, who were with the uh, restocked National Security Project, which was beefed up at the time. So Jamil and Amrit uh, said to a senior colleague one day, you know, we're thinking of filing a Freedom of Information Act suit. We want to find out more about is the government torturing people, and we're just hoping to get more information about this. And the senior colleague, who I will not identify for reasons you're about to see, said, oh, good luck with that. He said, yeah, never going to happen. A court is never going to order the government to turn over what they say is national security material, he said. I'll give you a nickel for every page you actually get a court to order. <laughs> well, I'm not mentioning his name because he reneged on the bet hundreds of thousands of pages later. But of course, the um, FOIA litigation was not enormously successful in even finding out who was detained. So um, I want to tell you about two other very creative attempts that we made to try to find out who was being detained. One, Udi Ofer, was the ACLU of New Jersey. In, uh, it turned out that the ACLU of New Jersey knew that the Bureau of Prisons, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, contracted with New Jersey County jails to put their overflow people. So the thought was, well, if they rounded up a whole lot of people after 9-11, where were they going to put them all? Well, perhaps in the New, New Jersey County jails. New Jersey has what's called a jailkeeper statute which requires, it's a sunshine law, and it says anybody in New Jersey has the right to inspect the jail records to see who's locked up. So the ACLU of New Jersey brings this suit, and the trial court says, uh, first they go to the sheriff who says, I'm not gonna tell you that. So they sue, and they win in the trial court. However, they ultimately lost on appeal because meanwhile, uh, federal INS Commissioner James Ziegler issued an order administratively preempting the New Jersey law. Okay, interesting example of preemption. But that was one attempt. The second attempt is something that I thought of, which was to try to use the Vienna Convention. And I'm sure Anthony and Nadine remember the executive committee uh, meeting when I said, well, you know, unless we're violating the Vienna Convention, if our government arrests people who are citizens of another country, we're supposed to be telling the consulates of that other country that we, in fact, have these people in custody. So maybe we could write to those embassies and consulates to ask them, yeah, do you have any people who you've heard we've arrested, and do they need any help knowing what their rights are? Well, Anthony <laughs> executed this idea quite nicely. Some of the governments like Egypt were really afraid of this. They said, whoa, you know, what is this, the American government trying to trap us? But others, especially Pakistan, was very interested in this whole question. And we ended up collaborating with the Pakistanis in a way that got us access to people who had been deported to Pakistan. So we were able to tell the stories of people to whom all this had happened. Okay, two other areas I want to very briefly highlight about our work. Uh, one was the um, reactions to torture. Now, as I already said, the Freedom of Information Act lawsuits um, led to here. This is the book that Jamil and Omri published with all the documents that they got finding out about torture. However, we have not had any headway so far in any sort of accountability. You know we're still waiting for the Senate Intelligence Committee to publish that report. Nobody has been held accountable. And when we went to the courts, we had not much luck getting the courts to pay any attention, where am I here? To our claims on behalf of victims of extraordinary rendition and torture. And I've been giving a talk that I call abjudication, because if you read the decisions in cases like El Masri and Muhammad, the federal courts have been just throwing up a barricade 
of arcane procedural excuses and reasons why they can't possibly decide what happened to people like this and whether it was constitutional, the state secrets privilege, standing, official immunity, etc. Now, I think that this is a great disappointment in terms of the role of the courts. Um, a third area where we attempted to litigate was the, um, I'm skipping around here because I don't want to run out of time. Okay, that's the executive order of President Bush. Okay, a third area where we've, we've attempted a lot of litigation, what Jeff Rosen was talking about yesterday, was surveillance, of course. And the um, Supreme Court put the uh, lid on the uh, argument that a number of lower courts had been making, more abjudication, that nobody has standing to challenge covert surveillance uh, practices unless they can prove that they've been subject to covert surveillance. Okay, we'll catch 22. So Edward Snowden, here with Anthony in an undis undisclosed location, uh, has provided us with standing, and we now have more litigation going about this. Now, I could tell you a lot of stories about our attempts to litigate, including a very early attempt we had to nip Section 215, the source of all the NSA spying and everything else. We tried nipping that in the bud in a case called Muslim Community Association, but the district judge was so afraid of this case that she let a government motion to dismiss remain pending for three years. Okay, there's that story. There are many other stories. We did have our victories. There's John Doe, Nick Merrill, who challenged the national security letters and gag orders. The Kind Hearts case, which was about a charity that had all its assets seized. I think, David, you were a co-counsel in that. Um, and then our most recent no-fly case, which, uh, in which the court ruled that there has to be a better way to get off the no-fly lists. So as Roger Baldwin says, it turns out oh, that, that, by the way, if, since I don't have time to talk about this, as Anthony was kind enough to mention, I've written a book on all this. So if you want to know all these stories, Oxford has published an updated paperback edition of, of my book in uh, March of 2014. So there's that. As Roger Baldwin thought, public opinion turns out to be the most important thing. And the ACLU's public education work since 9-11, I think, has been critical. The safe and free campaign, the answer to don't we have to give up some, some of our liberties in order to be safe, uh, began, the, I saw it in the executive committee minutes in um, October, of, uh, um, October 12th, already 2001. I think that's been very important. Rachel King, the first person to figure out what was actually in the Patriot Act, she was in our Washington office, and she posted the first things on anybody's website saying what was in the Patriot Act and why it was a problem for civil liberties. And this then went viral, journalists looked at it, and I think reactions to the Patriot Act are largely attributable to Rachel and to our Washington office. Now I want to briefly comment, before I'm going to have to wrap up, on um, metaphorical wars, other metaphorical wars. The war on drugs, of course, has done incalculable damage to the Fourth Amendment and to our mass incarceration policies. The report that you see here, War Comes Home, is a report that the ACLU published in June of 2014 before Ferguson about the very unfortunate consequences that occur when you start arming local law enforcement with, as if they're an army, and it looks like you're, they're having a war on people, a, you know, a racial war, a war, a criminal justice war, and to the right, of course, there is a picture of Ferguson, which, unfortunately, we were able to predict. So since I don't have time, I'm not going to tell you about Aziz Rana's uh, article, but maybe we can talk about that over the course of the day. Where I do want to end is with another quote from the ever-quotable Roger Baldwin, and this is something that he said after the end of the war to end all wars. And he said, the rule of law in place of force, always basic to my thinking, now takes on a new relevance in a world where, if war is to go, only law can replace it. But one of the things that Aziz Rana talks about, that Jeff Stone often talks about, that a lot of historians talk about, is whether we have learned as a society to do a better job of keeping track of our laws, of obeying our laws, even in times of crisis. What I find very moving about the thoughts of Roger Baldwin, the enemy of war altogether, is that I would like to translate this, however roughly, as inter leges silent arma. Is it too much to hope that in times of law, war will remain silent? There are my setting mistakes. Thank you.